Are you guys going to play hardball this time and say we're not going to let you pass this? You're not going to rush this through us in a few months I, before Election Day? Based on every conversation I've had with my colleagues so far this afternoon, everybody's prepared to play hardball. Whether Democrats will indeed play hardball over Donald Trump's soon-to-be-named Supreme Court nominee remains to be seen. Instead, it looks like the strategy Dems will center on will revolve around policy. The New York Times reports, quote, they would drop their demands that Republicans not appoint a replacement for Mr. Kennedy until after the midterm elections, senators decided, and instead would highlight the threat to abortion rights and health care to try and mobilize opposition to Trump's appointment. But is that enough? Joining me now is Gregory Coger, political science professor at the University of Miami, Jennifer Rubin, Washington Post opinion writer and MSNBC political analyst, and Jason Johnson, political editor of TheRoot.com and MSNBC political contributor. Thank you all for being here. I want to start with you, um, Dr. Uh, Coger, because I, um, Professor, Professor Coger, we wanted to have you on because you wrote a very interesting article that got a lot of people buzzing on social media. And what you wrote about was a potential... Um, sort of parliamentary procedure that Democrats could in theory use that could shut down the Senate, basically denying Republicans a quorum um, if all 49 Democrats refused to show up and then using that to halt all activity in the Senate. Could such a maneuver actually work to slow down or stop the Supreme Court nomination, however? The short answer is no. Um, just to explain, I wrote that blog post June 20th, which is 33 news cycles ago, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> major news stories. Um, and my main point was that the Senate should be a deliberative body that debates the main policy questions of our day, and that the, Senate's, the Senate Democrats could stand up for themselves and uh, break a quorum in an effort to get the Republicans to actually vote on the major things that we want them to vote on, like family separation at the border. Um, so... Uh, what they could do is is refuse to participate in votes and roll and quorum calls so the Senate doesn't have enough people present in order to make any decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, a quorum in the Senate is a majority, so that's 51 senators. Uh, there's only 50, 50 Republicans participating on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So if the Democrats force a roll call vote and then don't participate, the Senate comes to a screeching halt because there just aren't enough people there to make any binding decisions. Great. So it's a great way to protest. It's a great way to uh, force McConnell to actually sit down with the Democrats and say, how can we have a chamber that actually works, but which is fair to both parties? Um, what is not good for that technique is not good for indefinitely blocking a Supreme Court nomination, because there are things the majority party can do in response. Mm -hmm. They can instruct the sergeant at arms to force absent senators to come to the Senate chamber. Uh, and then once they are there, they probably have to use some procedural shenanigans, but they can count people who are in the chamber towards a quorum if they are willing to but professor, uh, break they the presidents of the Senate. Uh, right. They this don't is, even have to do that. The Senate rules are clear. You presume a quorum. And what happens, I actually checked with the leadership of the Democratic Party mm -hmm. and some people who are parliamentary gurus. It is presumed to have a quorum. The only way you break the presumption is having one of the Democrats there. And if you have one of the Democrats there, you have a, for, uh, you have a quorum. So right. none of this works at all. Um, you can come up with whatever rationale, but the presumption of a quorum makes all of this really moot. Well, and we did see in Wisconsin on, on a state level um, some Democratic members of the state Senate there, if you guys remember a couple of years ago, trying to block the gutting of unions, leave the state and, right. and, and all of the maneuvers that the Republicans used to drag them back, try to force them to come back. Eventually, they had to come back and vote. But here's the thing, um, uh, Jason, that frustrates Democrats, Democratic voters. Republicans... Back in November of 2016, before the election, about a week before the election, Republican senators actually went, some of them, on the floor of the Senate and vowed not just to block any Supreme Court nomination made by yes. a then-presumed yes. President Hillary Clinton, not for a month, not for six months, not for a season, but for four years, yes. if possible. Republicans vowed to keep the Supreme Court at eight members for four years, if necessary, to ensure that Hillary Clinton would never be able to make a Supreme Court nomination. So when right. Democratic voters hear that, 
And then they hear Democrats say, well, you know, we might talk about policy and we might talk about that this person's bad for the country, <laughs> but we're not going to try any of these really sort of Hail Mary tactics. Then Democrats say, but Republicans said they would block a, a nomination for four years. Is this yeah. just a stylistic difference between the parties that's irrevocable? No, Joy, and, and, and this is the thing. The Democrats, they're not about this life. They're not about real resistance. The leadership is terrible. And the leaderships have been terrible for years, and hopefully a lot of them get voted out this fall. Look, as the other political scientist uh, on this panel, I, I, I read this article with great interest. I've been talking to all the legislative people that I can speak of. And yes, there aren't a lot of structural ways that Democrats can prevent this from happening. Uh, you mentioned Wisconsin. There was also 2003. You remember 51 Democrats, the Killer Ds, they fled Texas to Oklahoma, yep. hung out in the Holiday Inn, and the cops yep. had to go after them. I mean, you know, I, I really doubt that Chuck Schumer is going to go hang out at the Holiday Inn for six months in order to keep this from happening. But at the end of the day, the Democrats have to demonstrate that they're willing to go to the wall to stop this from happening. And the fact that this idea, even if it may not work long term, isn't something that we've heard from the mouth of a Democrat in the Senate is indicative of the weakness and fecklessness of the leadership. They got to come up with something other than he's a bad guy because that didn't work stopping Trump in 2016. And, and I think, Jennifer, that is the frustration is that, Repu I mean, Mitch McConnell is ruthless. Let's just be blunt. He is probably the most ruthless politician in America, in a generation. He will, there is nothing he wouldn't do. There is no turnabout that he won't accept if he's completely on the other side of an issue today versus tomorrow when it's a Democrat versus Republican. He really doesn't care. He really doesn't. And so now you have coming out of not Democrats, but of, of people, intellectuals, people like our political scientists on the panel, like you guys, throwing out sort of ideas that the Democrats are like, no, never. Larry Tribe, um, Harvard professor Larry Tribe, law professor, said this, a president under active criminal investigation of whether he won legitimately and whether he has obstructed that very investigation should not be permitted by a mere Senate majority to designate the justice whose votes could prove pivotal to the fate of his presidency, meaning he could ensure Supreme Court they could say, yes, you can pardon yourself. Why haven't yes. Democrats said that argument? I don't know. I wrote an open letter to Jeff Flake on Friday suggesting exactly that, that he take the principled position, since he's now all about truth and democracy, that exactly as Larry said, that you cannot select a justice who is then going to turn around and exonerate you. And even if there was no such quid pro quo, it would be the appearance of a horrible conflict of interest. So the American people would never have faith in whatever outcome comes out of the Supreme Court, because there would be the assumption, since Trump asks for a loyalty pledge from everyone, uh, do we think he wouldn't uh, ask one from the uh, Supreme Court justice? So that means two things. Number one, you have to force him to recuse on anything having to do with the president's investigation ongoing now. Um, he won't do it, and that, I think, then becomes grounds for objecting to his uh, confirmation. Um, and secondly, um, you uh, throw up, um, I think, in front of... Uh, Ms. Collins and Ms. Zers uh, Murkowski, the two women Republicans, um, that they will be held responsible. They are doing the dance. They are pretending that um, because a nominee says this is all about precedent, that they can vote for him. No. The message to those two women, by Democrats, by pro-choice women in those two states, by the entire states of Maine and Alaska, has to be simple. You vote for this, Ms. Collins. Ms. Murkowski, you have voted to criminalize abortion. This is on you. And we're not going to accept these nonsense excuses that, well, because he said he was in favor of precedent, this won't count, you can vote for him. No, it has to be all out on the ground in those states. Those women have to be put under a glaring light um, so that they finally have to make a choice that actually does go against their party, unless they were just phony pro-choice women all along, which is distinctly possible. Which is distinctly possible. I wish we yes. had more time, but we need more time for this segment. Um, but I have to just thank Gregory Kroger, Jennifer, and Jason. will be back with us later in the show. And coming up, a